Hey, my name is Derek Thomas, and I'm a machine learning engineer at Hugging Face. And I'm really excited to talk to you about um, our enterprise hub and some of the features that you may not know about. Uh, we've been developing it significantly, especially in the last few weeks. Uh, and I have with me uh, Julian Simon. I'll let you introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks, Derek. Hi, everybody. My name is Julian. I am the chief evangelist of Hugging Face. And yeah, we're going to talk about the hub uh, and focus on the enterprise hub. Um, which, as Derek mentioned, has been uh, moving very, very quickly in the last few weeks. And we're going to give you a quick refresher on what the Hugging Face Hub is so that uh, we can uh, explain better how the Enterprise Hub is different. Okay, let's get started, Derek. Okay, so um, a lot of people know us as a kind of a collection of models. Uh, and so, but we started to expand into quite a, a number of features. So you can kind of get a good feel for what's going on um, in our trending section. Um, and we can see here that we have, you know, spaces, we have some data sets and models as well. Um, but we can actually go to the model page and maybe see a little bit more in detail what all we have available. Um, so uh, one of the most exciting things is how many models we have available. So yeah. uh, I don't know how many, do you, do you remember stops. when you joined how many models were on the hub? Uh, no, I forgot. I can tell you, I did a meetup last night uh, and I think it was 570,000. Uh, okay, so yeah. that shows you, yeah, it's, you know, I think it's thousands a day, but you know, I might be wrong, but that's, that's what it feels like. Yeah. Moving very fast. Yeah. So the, the really awesome thing about um, the hub is that it's kind of the default standard for when someone wants to share something. That's kind of how we started is that yeah. um, the community had this need of, we want to evolve quickly. We need a place to do that. That's more machine learning focused. Um, and so you can see to the left here, we have, you know, various tasks that you can sort these models mm -hmm. by and a number of other ways you can do it as well. Probably most notably is licenses. As yeah, know. I was gonna I was gonna call that out. Um, that's that's a popular question. You know, how do I find models that are commercially friendly? And that's how. Uh, yeah, Apache two, MIT uh, at the top here, are probably the ones you uh, you want to look at. Uh, not the only ones, but the main ones. So yeah, that's how you do it. Filtering on libraries. Well, I guess that would be PyTorch most of the time. <laughs> But uh, languages, languages, right? Um, you know, not everybody uh, speaks English, and so if you're looking for models in, you know, uh, German or uh, or uh, French or uh, Arabic or anything else, honestly, uh, yeah, that's how you find and them. You can really find a lot of these. Uh, I keep scrolling <laughs> yeah. and scrolling. Uh, oh, I'm yeah, not even going to reach the end there. To, in no, a it's a crazy time. list. It's One thing I'll call out is uh, we did just upload GGUF, um, and so there's some really cool compatibility there. Uh, we won't go as much in that uh, in this video, but I just want to talk about how we're evolving to what the community wants. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go ahead and dive into um, a model of choice. Uh, let's pick the most recent uh, exciting version from Databricks. Oh yeah, the Databricks uh, model. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so to, Julian, can you tell me a little bit about Safe Tensors? Um, yeah, so so Safe Tensors is um, is a, 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 a file format for model files. Um, and uh, and we've been uh, in the last year or so we've been converting uh, all the models on the hub to this new format. Previously, they used to be mostly pickle objects, and uh, the problem with pickle objects is uh, there's a uh, you know the remote chance that somebody is uh, uh, as as injected malicious code into the pickled object, uh, and that would trigger a potential code execution at model loading time. So. Uh, safe answers is uh, is a way to mitigate that, and security is very important. So um, so yeah, I would highly recommend that you uh, you work with uh, safe answers um, and GGUF as we populate that as well. Uh, and these are uh, these are safer file formats. And we'll talk about security more, but yeah, safe answers is really important. Yeah, no, I, I love that, and I love the fact that it's kind of evolved out of you know something that was convenient at the time into something that's yep. more meaningful. And I think that's what kind of is going to be the trend of what we're showing with the public hub and the the enterprise hub. Yeah, absolutely. Um, fundamentally, uh, you can see a lot of tags here. Um, you can see this one in particular. Uh, they have a limited release, so you need to actually mm -hmm. apply for it. Um, but we can see a lot of really good information. If, if I'm going to use this, I want to know where it came from, how it was trained, um, some important things like you know how big is it? Can I deploy it? Sure. Um, the research paper, uh, which you, which you also see in the tags. The archive mm -hmm. uh, research papers, the license, as you can see, 
Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, and again, all those are tags you can use for filtering too. So um, the, generally, you know, the, we encourage the model creators to give as much information on the model as possible uh, for the sake of, you know, transparency, just working with things you understand instead of working with, uh, you know, black box APIs, uh, which, you know, we don't like so much. So, <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, this is, this is all good stuff. Yeah. And uh, of course, what's in there? <laughs> Click on this. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I love what you said, transparency. Uh, well, this one. Oh, uh, this one is a gated one. Yeah. Let's <laughs> right, take gated, one. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, let's pick a little mistral, yeah. they're very open. All right. right? So, um, oh, there like we go. Said, Transparency is kind of the cornerstone of collaboration. I need to know what's going on. I need to know the history. Um, and I can find that in two different ways. I can find like the literal model history if I go to the commits um, and I can see exactly what changed in code. Um, and I can even go back in time to those. Um, and I can see who contributed those. Um, yeah. So each each repo here, it's each model is actually Git repo. So uh, if you use the, the URL, um, which is a little tiny here, but if you use the URL for that, uh, for that model page, you can actually clone directly from there. So you can git clone hoggingface.co slash mistrollai slash, yeah, there we go. Um, so that's nice. Uh, I, I rec generally, I would recommend working with the open source libraries to load the models, but for uh, maybe automation and DevOps purposes, it's obviously, uh, easier to work with the tools you already use, so uh, so you can clone and 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 feed the that cloned repo to your DevOps pipeline, and um, and that's the easy way to do it. And one question there, so um, I know some of those uh, some of the viewers might not know as much about how Git works with um, large files, and so oh yeah, um, do I really need to merge <laughs> something like a safe tensor file that's five gigs? Um, how, yeah, how so you see that, that LFS uh, icon here, uh, which means large file support, uh, and that's a that's a Git extension. Uh, so um, so basically, the, the it, we on the hub we split uh, file hosting into small files, which are actually stored um, in in the Git repo itself, and we have large files. I think the limit is is ten megabytes. It used to be ten. It might be more now. I, I don't know. I need to double check. And those are actually just pointers. Um, and uh, the actual artifacts are stored in uh, in uh, object storage. So that's just uh, that's just an easy way to manage very, very large files in um, in git uh, without having to commit uh, you know huge things and and push everything all the time, even if you haven't uh, even if you haven't the need to. So uh, what that really means is if you work at, with Git, uh, just make sure you have Git LFS enabled on your machine. Otherwise you get uh, uh, not so friendly error messages on, uh, well, that <laughs> file couldn't be pushed. And well, that's that's why. <laughs> so Git LFS is yeah. No, makes sense. Thank you so much. Um, so we've kind of talked a little bit about how you can collaborate from a, a code perspective, mm -hmm. but what about the human perspective? Um, oh yeah. The community tag, uh, the community tab. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So 76. So obviously this is a hot Yeah, That's model. a busy one. Yeah. That's a busy one. Um, so I yeah, well, that's, happened. yeah. So, uh, well, as you can see, you can, you can, it's kind of a mini forum for that model. Uh, you can ask questions. Um, and uh, and this uh, you know this is a good way to get in touch with uh, maybe model creators or or people who are actually using the model and keeping an eye on that community page. So um, you know it's everything in one place, very cool. And yeah. you can also have pull requests, right? I don't know if we have right. pull requests on the on this one. Yeah, so we have a number. Uh, yeah, yeah so we have a few. Okay, so uh, and, and those are uh, literally pull requests, just like on on GitHub. So uh, if you'd like to uh, to update something in that model repo, so in that case, that's the README file. It could be the model weight. It could be the model configuration. It could be a new um, a new version of the weights. Uh, sometimes you see that uh, the creators have uh, retrained the model, uh, and so there's kind of a new release, and uh, and uh, you can see all of that. So uh, yeah, basically exactly the same as pull requests on GitHub. So the collaboration flow uh, we should feel very natural. Um, it's no different from uh, from what you're doing with your code projects on GitHub or GitLab. Exactly. So you should feel very comfortable if you're native with Git in yep. a software engineering background or any yep. other background. It's a dev thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's a dev thing. The hub is for devs. 
Um, just quickly, I want to highlight, um, it's really nice to have a model, but not many people want to model for its own sake. Um, you typically want to use it somewhere. And so here you can see that we have um, how you'd use it in SageMaker. Mm -hmm. um, you can choose your task and it'll automatically fill out. Well, actually, you talked about AWS. Uh, you wrote the books. So. <laughs> ah, yeah. Well, you don't need to remind me of that. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, so we have plenty of content uh, on, uh, on SageMaker. Um, so you'll, we won't spend too much time. But uh, as you can see, we literally generate the code, the Python code based on the SageMaker SDK in this case. And you simply copy paste that into a notebook um, and run it and you deploy the model on um, on AWS. So we have training code, we have uh, inference code. Um, for some select models, uh, we also have code for um, the AWS custom accelerators, Inferentia and Trainium is coming soon. Um, same ID, generate that code, just copy paste it and deploy. So, uh, so yeah, we want to make it simple. You know, we want to make it simple to deploy those models, uh, regardless of where you want to run them. Uh, and so you have you have code snippets for different things, and and uh, and you can deploy them on our own service, also called Inference Endpoints, um, which yeah we see here as well. Um, and uh, uh, you can deploy them on uh, Azure ML if that's your thing. And uh, we recently announced a partnership with uh, Google Cloud. So, you know, expect <laughs> expect a Google Cloud uh, a Google Cloud deployment option in that menu at some point. And of course, you can always Absolutely. work with the open source libraries just like that uh, in any environment. So, yeah, we want to save you time. We want to make it simple to 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 work with those models, even if you're not an expert. Uh, your starting point is just copying and pasting that code and and uh, hit the ground running. Yeah. So we've seen kind of how we can find models. Uh, we know we can mm -hmm. search. Uh, we have a lot of tags to filter on. Uh, we've seen how we can understand them. So I can find a model. I can decide if I want to use it. If I do want to use it, I can understand the history. And most importantly, I have a way of actually deploying it and using it in a number of ways. I'm not yes. forced to use Hugging Faces offerings. I can use cloud offerings, but I also have easy ways of using Hugging Face offerings as well. Sure. Um, so that's pretty interesting, but that's just one model, right? Um, is there a way to collaborate across, uh, let's say I have a lot of models in a group, you know, if I have a team, yeah. um, does Hugging Face have a solution for me or what would that look like? Of course, uh, collaboration, uh, you know, goes beyond uh, what you can do with the community. It, it also means collaborating with your colleagues inside your uh, inside your company. And so, we have this uh, this concept of um, the organization. And here we see, for example, the Databricks organization. So, what is an organization? An organization is a group of people who want to collaborate on models data sets, uh, spaces, and um, uh, potentially uh, needing uh, private access, private collaboration on all those artifacts without the rest of the world <laughs> seeing what they work on, right? Um, and, yeah. uh, and we have thousands and thousands of organizations on the hub. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's Databricks and maybe, yeah, show, there's Intel, I guess. Yeah, let's, let's look at the Intel org. Um, we have a we we have a ton, and uh, and so that's uh, that's also a way. Uh, in this case, oh yeah, there's a lot of folks in Intel. Great! Oh wow! Wow, almost and a thousand. A yeah, might be one of the largest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and and that's uh, that's how, for example, Intel shares also their um, uh, their models and and artifacts with the rest of the community. They upload them in their organization, so everything lives under the same uh, uh, the same hood, so to speak. Um, and um, so they can ex collaborate both internally and externally. Yes, so, exactly. So they, so they can collaborate models. internally, making things, making models and data sets private, um, and uh, and and I guess you know getting them ready for public consumption or not. You know, uh, things can stay private, um, or you can start private and then make them public and share them with everyone else. So obviously, that means somebody has to decide who joins the org, who can do what in the org. So there are a number of uh, permissions and uh, and roles. Uh, and uh, yeah, Derek, tell us about that. Yeah. So uh, let me go ahead and open up an organization that I control. Um, yes. So um, demo corp. Yeah, that's us. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we do. That's right. 
Um, so it's easy enough to now, go Can to you settings. maybe zoom in a, a little bit just so that the maybe our viewers, yeah, much better. Thanks. Yeah. Great call. So I can easily go here and I can see some basic settings. We don't need to dive in too much to that, mm -hmm. but I can go and then see members, right? Okay. So, um, the nice thing is I can kind of, um, one of the challenges, especially if you're a popular org like Intel, um, mm -hmm. they may want to identify who is, um, who should join and who shouldn't join. Sure. Of course. Um, so they can automatically allow uh, requests if they choose to. Um, let's say they have like Intel community or just something mm -hmm. completely outward uh, focusing. They can even automatically approve these. Um, yeah. But if they want to be more private, they can remove this as well. Yeah, uh, just explicitly. Uh, yeah, let people ask to join or add them explicitly. That's up to you. Right. Um, and then, yeah, so uh, I guess you need admins to keep everything running. And then uh, read and write uh, are pretty obvious. So uh, if you're, uh, yeah, go, go and explain it, Derek, you, you know, that stuff. That yeah. So, um, ultimately, yeah, read and write is exactly as you expect, write can write to any repository and it's kind of the, the, the fundamental currency is a repository. Um, and then you have contributor, which is a little bit more interesting than write because, um, you might have people that, uh, they have a lot of interesting ideas, but you don't want to give them full permissions. So, um, contributors are allowed to write to repos that they create. Um, so uh, it's kind of like write junior, yep. so to speak, Maybe like writing for interns. Um, yeah. So that's that's the basic org, right? So that that will be available to to, to I would say all users on um, on the hub. And creating an org is free. I mean, we should mention that. Uh, you, you know, you can create it in seconds and start uh, collaborating with your um, collaborating with your uh, uh, internal community, making things private or public, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then um, some of our customers need more, right? They need more security. They need more compliance. Um, and, and that's where, I guess, we start talking about the enterprise hub. So, and you can actually see on the left uh, some, of those, um, some of those features here have been enabled because this org is an enterprise hub organization. So the enterprise hub is a commercial service. Okay. Um, so you can easily, uh, you can, you can easily subscribe um, and, uh, and start enjoying the, the extra features. So should we just walk them, walk through that each one of them? What do you think? Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Um, so now that I kind of understand what an organization is, what are some of the, uh, the the features you would want to see in an organization? I would think like you need to have control, some governance. Um, yeah. And beyond that, it needs to be secure. Uh, and lastly, I would say uh, having some compliance as well, um, especially yeah. depending on where you are in the yeah. world. Enterpr the enterprise hub is really, is really a, um, um, an answer to the need for... Um, Increased security, increased compliance, increased auditing, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the, the first thing that always uh, came up in customer discussions is, well, I've got my uh, single sign-on system, you know, so uh, my mm -hmm. users are already managed inside my IT. Um, and I certainly don't want to uh, proliferate user accounts on the hub because if somebody leaves the company, then that's another account I need to manually shut down and that could be a security risk if somebody forgets to do that. So can we sync our, uh, our user directory with, uh, with the hub user directory? And that's that SSO uh, feature. So SSO is, is a bit of an insane uh, topic. Um, so let's just keep it at, yes, you can plug your SSO into, uh, into the hub um, using OpenID, using uh, using SAML, um, and set things up so that uh, users that are known um, and and who have permissions in your uh, IT platform can apply the same uh, permissions, and uh, yeah, be mapped to uh, to users on the hub, right? Yeah. Um, so there's a bit of plumbing involved, um, but that's that's what you can get. Uh, so now you the the customer benefit is. You don't need to duplicate and proliferate user accounts uh, on a third party uh, on a third party web server uh, with the potential risk of not uh, you know shutting down those accounts when, when when the employees leave. So this probably was the number one request. Yeah, um, oh, for sure. 
Yeah, you heard that one too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Many and, times. And if you want to be able to control users, which uh, is what SSO is allowing, it's giving people access or rejecting access and taking it away efficiently. Um, the next thing you would want is to know what's happened historically. You want yeah. to, have to be able to do things, and you want who did, to have who the did what? To, to work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Start pointing some fingers. Uh, this one, it's pretty easy to point the finger. It's it's mostly me, um, but you can imagine an organization. No. So it's all your fault. Having... Okay, great. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. at me too. I don't want it to be my fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so pretty uh, pretty obvious what what this is, right? So you see all the actions on uh, all the actions on on the org itself. Uh, you know, creating a private space, adding users. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we know how, um, you know, auditing is critical for, for regulated organizations who need to demonstrate compliance. You know, it's not enough to say you are compliant when the time comes for your, you know, third party audit or internal audit, you need to demonstrate that controls are in place, that they work and that everything is fully documented. So this might not look very sexy, honestly, but it's it it might be you know one of the most important features in uh, um, in adopting the enterprise hub. Yes, absolutely. This was our second most requested feature, and this is something we expect to iterate a little bit. And we, we expect yep. to see things like filtering, um, sure. downloadability, you know, just some sure. some ease of use features. Um, Resource groups. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, or actually, let's do one more before that, just kind of in the oh, regions. Of oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, especially in the EU, I know it's really important to decide where something lives. You don't want to have, yes. uh, you want it to be fully compliant. You need to have the ability to store something in the EU if it's yours, as opposed to it being in the US or in Asia. Um, yeah. But, you know, data locality is, um, is always a hot topic, um, you know, regardless of, whether there is a risk or not a risk, you know, EU customers are just more comfortable with uh, hosting in the EU. And, and, and some customers are, you know, by law or regulation, uh, forced to host everything in the EU. So it's not even a choice they have, you know, they have to do it or they can't use the service. Right. So, um, so um, that's, that's uh, what this uh, feature brings, the ability to, decide where your uh, artifacts are hosted uh, and um, and we have us EU uh, I guess we'll keep uh, we'll keep adding more but that's already again uh, a, a critical feature for uh, for EU customers who uh, who were not comfortable or just could not consider hosting um, um, artifacts in the US which which is where the hugging face hub runs all right so uh, that shows you why regions are kind of uh, both important and interesting uh, mm -hmm. for different types of uh, potential users. Um, but one thing I know is that organizations tend to have a lot of teams. And yeah. from what I can tell, uh, the organizational permissions just showed very broad access for um, the entire organization. Um, so uh, what, what can I do about that? So the main way of solving that is something we've added called resource groups. Um, and resource groups are essentially what you consider different teams in an organization. Um, so just like you might have a financial team, a data science mm -hmm. team, um, maybe a software engineering deployment team. Uh, here you can specifically decide what your resource group is. Um, so I like the data science team. Let's, let's do that. <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, just kind of a, it's just another level of granularity, right? So within the org, we can further you know, uh, break down users into into smaller groups with different permissions. Exactly, I can add repositories. Um, so, you know, I won't actually go through the exercise here, but you can see here I can add any model data center space. Mm -hmm. And then of course I can add the relevant users to that as well. So it's another level of granularity. Okay, nice, nice. Um, yeah, because in the past, I mean, I, I've, I've met customers who actually, um, created different orgs you know they, they they had to manage different orgs for different teams and well that, i guess that was a little bit inconvenient so here you don't have to do that you can have everyone under the same org uh, you have you know role based access admin read write contributor and if you need to split things down uh, to the next uh, level of granularity then you can do uh, you can do resource groups yeah that's that's pretty cool Super yeah useful. so easy to govern 
All right. What about the last one? Advanced security. I think that's is that brand new? I don't I don't remember seeing yeah. this. Yeah. So this just literally. Or did I miss out. it? I think you know, it just came out, I think, yesterday. Oh. Uh so we so really had it. a lot of fast activity uh <laughs> by our team. Um and this is a you know, a, a really important feature, despite it being basic. And um, what we found is a lot of uh, enterprise groups, they want a default way of saying um, most, you know, we're a very private organization. We want most of our repos to be either private by default, yeah. um, or um, you might have organizations that are the opposite. We're very much collaborative. We want to be open. We want activity with the community. And so we want them to be public by default. So you have a number of ways of Okay. Uh, of shaping based on your yeah preference. that yeah that that came up a lot of times in in, in customer discussions uh, and I think you know I, I would recommend private by default because better safe than sorry um, you know you don't want the intern to to share something they shouldn't be sharing because they didn't know better yeah yeah and and then you can uh, and generally I mean even from a collaboration perspective that's that's how things go um, you start working internally. And then, uh, you know, some projects are meant to stay completely private and that's fine. And maybe some of them are uh, are okay to share with the community, but then you can switch the, the let's say, the model or data set visibility to, to public, but on a model uh, basis or a, a data set basis. So, yeah, uh, strong defaults are generally preferable when it comes to security. Right, right. All right, so, yeah, so there's quite a bunch. I mean, um, there's quite a bunch of uh, of new features for uh, for enterprise users, and uh, you know, from the SSO to uh, to the auditing to the fine grained uh, control on users and and uh, and permissions, and of course, data locality with regions. So all of, all of that is is really coming from you know direct customer feedback, and um, and this is really you know unlocking. Um, the hub, in a way, for uh, for regulated companies and, um, and 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 users who couldn't be using the the public hub because because they live in a complicated world. So <laughs> this is this is all nice. Uh, we should also mention um, that uh, generally the the Hugging Face Hub and 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 the the services around it uh, are also uh, SOC two compliant. Uh, so we did pass. Uh, a SOC 2 audit uh, a while ago. Uh, we can share the the SOC 2 report with customers, but that's only under NDA. So uh, in your uh, compliance process, you will need the document. And of course, we can provide it. And of course, we are uh, GDPR compliant. We have a privacy policy and all that good stuff. So uh, feel free to look at that and uh, get in touch if you uh, if you have questions or if you need, um, if you need uh, additional information on all of this. So uh, yeah, the enterprise hub. There, you, there we go. Uh, pretty nice, uh, pretty nice product, I think. What do you think, Derek? Yeah, <laughs> your customers uh, like it. <laughs> yeah, we've had a a big sale um, come in yesterday. So uh, a large organization yeah. wanted to um, to have five hundred users, um, and so Ooh, we expect that's it to. Pretty sweet. We expect that to see uh, to see that happen more and more often. Um, there is one last thing I did want to mention. Um, a feature that didn't yeah. quite fit in our earlier conversation. Um, what you'll find a lot of times is a lot of uh, different you know machine learning teams or data science teams have a very specific workflow. There's probably something, no matter what tool you use out there, no matter how comprehensive it is, there's probably some aspect that's new or it doesn't cover. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a really strong API that allows you to you know build some of the you know you talked about CICD earlier. If you want to yeah. build something very specific to your organization, um, we leave it very open, just in the same way that we're open in a lot of other ways. Um, and so. You have a lot of uh, power and control with that. So you, you've seen yeah, sure. like uh, the security features, you've seen the community features. You also have strong configurability as well. Yeah, that's that's important because um, you know uh, some customers want to uh, they want to to integrate the hub workflows into their own um, training and deployment and 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 CI/CD workflows. So um, so yeah, having having Git. Uh, a Git workflow having uh, yeah the Hub API, uh, which of course is uh, is available on on GitHub, um, um, the the Hub command line etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, all, all of that stuff is is super useful to to automate uh, and you know we're pretty confident that whatever you're using today um, the the Hub will uh, will fit nicely into 
into that uh, into that platform. So good, good call out. All right, I think that's really uh, that's really what we wanted to cover uh, today on the on the enterprise lab, uh, Derek. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, you know your time and expertise. That was a lot of yeah, fun. Yeah, sure. It was nice chatting with you, and um, and maybe we'll do more. You know, there are lots of good features. Uh, that keep coming and uh, and we'll certainly keep everybody updated out there. So uh, thanks a lot for listening. Um, feel free to ask questions in, in the comments. Feel free to get in touch on LinkedIn or anywhere you can find us on the Hugging Face forums, uh, you know, discuss.huggingface.co. <laughs> there are many ways to contact us and, and get help or uh, answers for our questions. All right, well, see you later, Derek. Thank thanks you so everybody, thanks for one. watching. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye.